Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Remy Rosenbaum, and I'm the VP Marketing at Caserta. I'll be your host for today. At Caserta, we're solving clients' toughest data and analytics challenges through our unrivaled talent and relentless innovation. We provide our world-class clients with professional services in technology consulting, design, and implementation with an exclusive focus on data and analytics. Our team of top-notch consultants are force multipliers for our clients that depend on us to provide transformative data strategies and solutions to advance their analytics-driven businesses. Our uncompromising dedication to finding the right answer to our clients' tough data challenges is a hallmark of our firm, and our projects incorporate emerging technologies and the latest in design patterns and innovative solutions through modern data engineering. Caserta's complimentary webinars by industry experts like today are designed to give you insight into today's hottest technological trends and issues. After the webinar, you are encouraged to contact us with any questions on how to apply what you have learned today at your firm. Following the completion of today's webinar, a recording of the presentation will be sent to the email address you provided. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, you are encouraged to enter them in a questions panel on the right and we'll answer them during the Q&A session at the completion of the webinar. Today you will learn how leading financial services firms are exploiting the power of a modern data architecture and cloud-based applications to transform their business. We have two excellent presenters today. Our first presenter, Alex Lovell Troy, Vice President of Innovation at Caserta, will explore modern data architecture and its business benefits, address cloud security concerns for the financial services industry, and explore insightful use cases. We will then hear Dimitri Pecker, former Managing Director, Head of Alternative Data at Oxif Capital Management, explore alternative data and machine learning and how those capabilities are revolutionizing the financial services industry. And today we're going to begin with Alex. So I just want to get started by explaining a little bit about who I am and why it is that I'm uh, giving a financial services based um, modern data architecture discussion. Um, as the Vice President of Innovation at Caserta, one of the things that I need to do is take a look at where the industry is headed, both the industry of data management, um, but also the industries of the customers we serve, and try to project out not just one year from now, what, what sorts of things are our customers going to be looking for, but five years from now, what kinds of things are our customers going to be looking for. So in the past, some of the, uh, the items that I have bet big on are the idea of serverless um, and the idea of blockchain. Um, Right now, I'm, I'm uh, working with a, a team on some Kubernetes experiments. These are very technology focused. I also need to be looking at where the strategy comes from. And this is why I spent some time working with our, our friends in the UK on uh, some GDPR strategy uh, ideas, um, and also sort of how to meet the coming set of regulations around privacy um, for all businesses but particularly when financial information is, uh, is involved. So I definitely come at this from a where should we be going perspective. Uh, I also come at this from a security perspective and definitely a cloud first focus. So we're, today we're gonna talk a little bit about where I see the financial services industry and how, uh, how, I think, how I'm thinking about it as we head forward. Um, so I'd like to move on to the state of data in financial services. This will cover where we currently are and where we are, where we're going from a platform perspective. So first of all, um, financial services as it exists today is getting squeezed. Um, the expanding complexity of data and the narrowing of regulations and competition is really going to change the way that uh, financial services companies use data. The number of potential data sets that can provide a competitive advantage has never been as high as it is today, and it will never be lower than it is today. This growth is staggering, and it's not just the number. The volume and complexity of those data sources are in the same position. There's more data than there's ever been, and it will get more complicated, not less. The regulations like IFRS and GDPR, um, while we haven't fully implemented them yet, they're putting pressure on financial services as they try to govern the data you've already got. Uh, according to Gartner, about 80% of financial services firms will not exist in a recognizable form in a decade. The time to make your data your competitive advantage is now. And I think that that internal disruption is something that uh, existing financial services firms are likely to do. It is more likely there than, uh, than upstart. The, the barrier to entry is just too high. So as the financial services um, industry moves to cloud, and as they are their own disruptors. 
uh, I think there's going to be a few things that, that they're, they're going to need to learn that some of the industry has already learned. So first of all, um, the difference, the, the shift from capital expenses to operational expenses. A lot of the difference between a traditional um, data architecture and a modern data architecture is, is, is um, wrapped up in this shift. Um, we see that we see that 10 years ago, um, firms like yours worked with your sales rep from Oracle, IBM, you know, HP, whatever, uh, to buy the best box that you could and load it up with the right software. This was to support a carefully modeled business. Now, they wanted you to think about your compute and storage needs with a five to 10 year capitalization schedule. And that wasn't just because that was, these were good salespeople. That was because what you had told them was that you were looking at this as a capital expense that was going to be renewed over time. And so a lot of the, the sales tactics and a lot of the product development was based on what you would be interested in buying. So when you did buy it, you were, you've got roughly, you know, five to 10 year capitalization schedule, predictable performance to do what you knew you needed to do. If you needed to scale, it was to do those same things, um, maybe with more data, maybe the same things faster, but this just meant adding hardware or replacing one old box with a new one. The key to all of this was predictability, which led to stability. Many of these systems are still in service today, and we see them um, across the industry. Uh, and they're doing a good job of, exact, of doing exactly what they were bought for. But in the case where we're going to be in, uh, doing the disruption of ourselves, we need to look at flexibility as something more important than stability. Now, that doesn't mean, uh, that doesn't mean we want to compromise on security, um, but we do need to think about how can we meet our, need, our customers' needs and how can we innovate, innovate um, as we are thinking more about what gets us from here to the next iteration rather than what gets us from here to the next 20 years. So about five years ago, the cloud really started this, uh, this move from capital expenses to operational expenses. And companies were suddenly focused on, uh, fo companies at the time who were focused primarily on stability and not on flexibility were being outcompeted. And you see this on, you know, the, the, the standard stories that, you know, the world's largest taxi company owns no taxis because they just want to be paying, they want to be renting the drivers and, and cars on an as needed basis. Um, but this is, this is a business model that's made possible only because compute could also be uh, handled that same way. Now, these new interests, these new industries that have taken advantage of this, um, they have been the, uh, uh, the disruptors, um, on, they have been the, the disruptors, and now I think uh, it's finally become time for the financial services co uh, companies to come around and do the same thing. So that means we need to think outside the box. I think many of you already have an Oracle system someplace. You're thinking about whether to replace it or not. Um, that's why I'm using this picture. Uh, the answer is that you, you need to supplant this with something else. And I say that this is cloud. So cloud data storage is significantly, much, significantly cheaper than you expect. Um, I was doing some cost comparisons for a customer recently that moving all of their data estate, something like 80, uh, 80 terabytes, um, was going to take an afternoon and was going to cost them about $55. That, that amount of data storage is just not the kind of thing we were thinking about 10 years ago. That kind of data movement is not the kind of thing we were thinking about flippantly. 10 years ago. Um, the capacity is virtually limitless. Uh, I have never, so when I was working on, um, on data infrastructures that had to think about how many lungs were going to be required to support the business, we spent a tremendous amount of time talking about the strategy for finding disks and replacing disks and looking at the capacity of disks. Uh, we don't do that anymore. Instead, we just talk about the provision capacity within the cloud, and we trust that it will always be there. Our backups don't now need to run on tapes. We don't have to manage off-site tape storage. We can do all of these things with cloud services that we don't have to buy with capital, uh, that we can just pay for as we need it. And at the time we don't need it anymore, we stop paying for it. So while the scalability goes huge, 
it also goes very tiny. You can go to 11, go to 0 0.01. Um, the other thing to point out, and this is controversial, I'm going to spend a little bit more time on this, but cloud security is actually better than on-premise security. And uh, to show you, like, to show you what I mean, um, the security model that I was putting in place about 10 years ago was uh, concentric circles. Each additional concentric circle, each additional circle, provided a layer of defense around that core asset. And in some cases, that core asset was data. In some cases, that uh, core asset was an application that accessed the data. But you had first your users, uh, your role-based access control that went around that. And then you had sort of access to the systems that had uh, uh, that, that went around that. Maybe you had network security. Maybe you had physical security. Like all of those things. Um, but you were still thinking of it as one big thing to secure. If you put all your eggs in one basket and then you take really, really good care of that basket, um, then, uh, then that's your security model. Um, and it was because we didn't really have alternatives. As cloud has gotten bigger, you need to, as cloud has gotten bigger and as development teams that are innovating more quickly uh, have stopped being so lockstep with each other, compartmentalization has become more important than, uh, for, than one big box. So now you want your eggs in lots of baskets, but you want to know exactly where those eggs are, and you want to know um, in, a, in, in a second if any of those eggs are not as safe as they were 10 seconds ago, right? So you put your governance at the corporate level. You still build um, security around each piece, but you keep each of those pieces completely separate. A compromise in any one of them has no effect on the others. And this is something that when I start working with financial organizations uh, and deal with their security teams, um, this is a hard place to start because this starts from a place where we say, we don't really need to start with a VPN. We'll probably need to get there at some point with strong network security around something, but let's work forward towards that rather than assume it from the start. Um, enforcement still becomes local, governance becomes, uh, stays global, and the, the programs that lead to uh, how do we protect our data and where do we protect our data, those are still critically important. But shifting that focus from everything in one basket to lots of baskets uh, allows you to move a lot faster. It also allows you to keep things very tightly compartmentalized, uh, which leads to better security. So this is a good example. This gets a little technical, but this is a good example of a security model on the cloud for an application that uses some form of, of data. Um, it keeps everything internal as you to, to the application, including the data, which may be delivered via some sort of pipeline, uh, some sort of uh, data pipeline, um, just for the use of this application, or the application may reach out of its security context to a different security context to pull in data. As you start gathering more of these together, you see what I mean by compartmentalization. Each application is fundamentally separate from the, under, the applications around it, and you can start to move uh, applications to the cloud with their data as they go with a governance scheme on top that says, here's how you manage each piece of that. Um, so this is where, this is, this is something that, uh, this is just the beginning of how security is better on the cloud. Um, we can go a lot further with this, I just want to caution you that I want to change the way you think about it, but I am not advocating for taking out centralized governance. I'm not advocating for taking for uh, throwing all of your users' private data on an S3 bucket and hoping that everybody is doing the right thing. There still does need to be checks and balances in there. Um, and we can go into that in a much longer talk. Uh, if you guys are interested, please go ahead and put that in the comments. Um, but having tackled the, I think this, the, the, the subject of, I think this goes better on the cloud, let me talk to you about what a modern data architecture really should look like. So this is the Caserta corporate data pyramid. And we put this together to try to explain a few things. Now, first of all, everybody wants a data warehouse. When they come to us and they ask us to get their, their house in order in terms of reporting, it's usually because someone has, or we have two different groups that are presenting uh, conflicting numbers and they can't trace it back to where the data came from. They're not really sure if the data lake has everything they need. They think that maybe there's been corruption, but they can't prove it. So they start looking at what they can see, which are the reports being generated on top of the data warehouse. What's true is that if you 
if you only uh, handle the big data warehouse at the top without first understanding the layers that lead to it, um, you're always going to be sort of playing catch up and going backwards. So what we advocate is keeping these layers separate, managing them independently as, the, uh, as independent pieces of an architecture, and making sure that once you've built the landing area and you, you actually understand how everything is governed uh, appropriately there, then you bring it up to a data lake, then you bring it up to a data science workspace, and then you bring it up to the big data warehouse. And that data science, web uh, that, that data science workspace um, is something that's fairly new. Uh, you're not gonna find this in a lot of the classic um, data warehouse uh, designs, a lot of the classic data um, architectures. Uh, we think it's super important because as you start to comp compete with data, as every company wants to say that they do, um, more and more you're gonna find that the data scientists need access to cleansed data that doesn't uh, expose you to security risks in a format that they can handle themselves without asking for help um, and in a place that they can work with it securely and not fear that they're accidentally interfering with other people's work. So that data science workspace, uh, it becomes the new piece that you add if you have a classic ar architecture and you move into a modern architecture. <clears throat> so taking a look at what that might look like on a cloud, um, we, uh, we separate it out and we say that the, the data lake needs to go into buckets. And this is your land and ingest phase, right? You then take everything, all of the data coming out of these, the, the, the buckets. So this would be your raw analytics data coming from you know, Google Analytics, for example. Um, but it might also be the public data sets that you've purchased and you're bringing them into the data lake before you've had a chance to really understand whether they are high quality or not. Um, maybe this is all the financial data for a, a, a firm going back, you know, 50 years. Um, and that firm changed the way they stored their data over time. You're going to have to figure out how to play with that. But before you can do that, you need a place where you keep it in a pristine fashion. Then you work through the state of the, the um, <coughs> excuse me, you work from the data lake towards the data warehouse using tools like uh, Spark or Airflow. Um, to manage the way that data gets cleaned, manage the way that the quality gets assured, um, manage the way that that data gets enriched to the point where it fits with a, uh, a model that can go into something like BigQuery, this, this, uh, what we've got listed here. That's really just a very large database built specifically for huge data sets. It's a big data store. We think that serverless functions applied to that data warehouse can, um, uh, help to bring aggregations in. It can help to do enrichment. It can do things like alert people when like possibly PII, something that looks like it might be PII has accidentally made its way in and then how to do the remediation. And then the next step is that data science workspace. We call this the present layer. So once you have cleaned all the data, asserted that it is correct, um, pulled it all together, now it's time to provide a view of that a sanitized view of that for your data scientists to use something like a Jupyter Notebook um, or uh, uh, Amazon SageMaker or um, Google's Data Lab to uh, work with the data in a protected perimeter that is attached to the cloud and then presented through, uh, through one of the cloud presentation tools. A Tableau is a very good example. Um, under, underlying all of this is continuous security management. So this is where your strong authentication and strong authorization schemes come in, and that's where you apply your governance, and it needs to go through every piece of this. But with the cloud IAM tools, that's a fairly easy thing to do. So now I wanna share two success stories, uh, and I wanna be conscious of time because I know that I'm running a little bit long. Um, the first one is, uh, is VARDA. Um, this was a, uh, a, Caserta a Caserta customer, um, and we started working with them on their data warehouse. This is a wonderful drop quote from, uh, from their CTO. Our considerable experience manifests itself in quick and effective approaches. Our analyses are focused and yield helpful recommendations in a very short amount of time. Uh, second, the team's technical and engineering skills are wide ranging. It's always nice to see these things. It's also nice to read them out loud. Um, 
Savarta Partners is a global alternative investment advisor focused on investing capital and resources across multiple segments and markets. The partner-owned firm searches for uncommon opportunities in a broad array of investments, including corporate assets and sovereign debt. Um, as these alternative sources of data come in on many types, many formats, the data was changing. <clears throat> and it was challenging to analyze in a unified view. As such, the analysts were struggling to gain a complete picture of the data. New sources of data could not be added. Each additional source would add to the complexity involved, stifling scalability. So what we did was we, uh, we helped them go from an on-site platform that was architected for individual reporting to one that was cloud-based. Uh, it's both extensible, it's flexible, it's to support their internal and external demands. And now Varda has a quicker uh, time to deliver, a quicker delivery time, along with an ability to contract and expand resources as needed. As needed. So this business outcome means that they're taking what they were doing before, um, and they're doing it a lot faster, but this time they are, they've moved from an on-premise manual thing to something that is managed in the cloud um, based on our data pyramid. Um, the architecture of the data warehouse enabled integration of new and evolving data sources. So as they now bring new things in, they get to use them faster. And that's really the, the business outcome from our, our example with Varda. So I have another case study. Um, and this one, we don't have all the pretty graphics for yet, but we are getting them. Um, this one is about en enabling data scientists. So as part of this innovation center at a bank, there was a team of researchers that spend most of their time trying to manage this big mess. Now that sounds kind of familiar to the Varda example as well. They still have, they both in both cases, it is the large set of uh, dirty data that made it difficult for them to create any manual process on premise that could handle things. In one case, it was for guiding investment. In another case, it's for doing research. But in both cases, it's the data quality was bad and we didn't know where it all was and we couldn't access it with the tools that we needed. Um, in this case, we empowered the, these researchers with tools that were fit for their domain, right? Um, in some cases, it doesn't make sense to work with the data in the data tools that a data engineer uses. It makes sense to work with the data in a tool that the researchers are comfortable with. So we helped to find one that could, a, a tool that could bridge the gap, that could understand their language and could work with our tool sets. Um, it needed to have this whole idea of farm to table management. When uh, a researcher had, uh, has a data set that they want to work with, they need to be able to find it. They load it in and they move to the next piece. Um, and then that quality and governance piece, each one of those needs to happen sort of transparently to the user. So the outcome for this company was that ten, they increased their data loading time or they decreased their, their data loading time so they could 10x the amount of data they could bring in. They are now growing a set of governed data, which is very distinct from their ungoverned data that was dirty and, and uh, ugly previously. Um, so each time they add something new to it, the whole system gets better. And the researchers are working in a domain-specific language that's useful to them. So this is the idea that once you take a, a modern data architecture and you apply it to problems of the business, we can actually make everything move quite a bit faster. So you can too. Um, I know I'm out of time, but uh, if you would like to reach out and, and call us, we're gonna work with you to choose your first data product. We're gonna recommend that you explore it with someone who's done it before, collaborate with us, and then repeat, repeat, repeat. Your data sets will get bigger and better uh, as we move you into a modern data architecture. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alex. Uh, now we're going to continue on to uh, Dimitri, who is going to talk to us about alternative data and machine learning for financial services. And Dimitri, take it away. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so my name is Dimitri Peter. Uh, until recently, I was uh, managing director at Federal Federal alternative data and business intelligence at uh, Oxid Capital Management, which is a, 
as a relatively large hedge fund uh, uh, in New York City. I spent about 11 years there. I've, I've been in the financial industry for about 18 years. I uh, currently am and then doing some consulting, helping some buy side for firms uh, figure out how to use alternative data or data in general more more effectively. Um, so, what is alternative data? Uh, it's a term that hasn't really existed until you know probably two or three years ago when I first started getting into it. That 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 wasn't something that everybody was was talking about. Um, it has nothing to do with alternative facts. Uh, it's uh, you know in the in the old days it was it was just called data, but because of how this data proliferated and and, and became available fairly suddenly uh, in in terms of what what you can get and then and, and how quickly and uh, from how many vendors. I guess people decided to, to, to give it an official name. Uh, at some point, people were saying that it was anything that you can get on Bloomberg. Uh, now Bloomberg is getting into alternative data, so that, that's uh, no longer valid. Uh, but uh, there's still, uh, some people think that it's anything that isn't market data or fundamental data uh, would, would count as, as, as alternative data. Uh, as you can see here from the chart that I took from alternativedata.org, which is actually a very, very useful website if you want to check it out, the, the number of providers has increased significantly. And, and you know, it's, getting to a, a pretty crazy uh, amount where I, I think there's going to be some some sort of large consolidation where, you know, people like Bloomberg, potentially Faxet, um, uh, I don't know, JP Morgan might, might start gobbling up all these uh, alternative data providers and consolidating them. Um, but, yeah, it, 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 it's getting, you know, I, I, I'm not a part of the hedge fund anymore, but I still get, you know, daily solicitations from, from, from multiple providers asking me if I want to buy their data. Uh, so what, what are the types of alternative data? Uh, well, one big thing is, is web scraping. Uh, and I know in, in large banks, they have huge floors of, of, of people who are, who are doing nothing but, but web scraping. There, there are companies that specialize in web scraping. They'll, they'll scrape the data for you and then just provide, you, provide it to you as a feed. And there, there are some few companies that specialize in, in, in doing uh, custom web scraping. So it's a very, very popular category. One, one of the big things that that I have, uh, I guess, a problem with, with with web scraping is that you get no history, right? So if if you if you start scraping data today, that's the first day you you have that data. Before you can you can figure out whether that data are any good. I would say it'll it'll take you, you know, two or three years. Of collecting that data to, to, to figure out whether that data is predictive in any way. Uh, the, the exceptions are probably some some specialized or custom projects where you can, you can get some something very very specific. But a lot of a lot of people scrape a lot of data, and uh, they, they they definitely think that it's uh, very useful. Um, consumer transaction data is also very popular. The, the credit card transactions or, or the email receipts that you can buy from um, from data providers that uh, organize people email boxes. Uh, those are both 
often useful and uh, can can uh, can can give you some some very important and interesting information. Uh, data from sensors, and that's that's it's a pretty broad category. I think it would include things like satellite data. Uh, there, there are people who are installing custom sensors that look at heat generated by pipelines and based on the heat that they can estimate how much whatever uh, you know oil or, or, or gas or, or some other substance that goes through those pipelines and then they can make projections on uh, you know how a specific company is doing or how how um, the price of uh, whatever commodity they're tracking is, is going to do in the future. There, there are some people who are installing this next to Tesla plants, and I guess they can they can figure out how many cars that they that they're they're going to produce based on on the heat or energy consumed or something like that. There 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 is a lot of very interesting uh, sensor data that you can get. Uh, sentiment data, I guess, was, was the original alternative data where people were starting to scrape Twitter and then and, and, and different message boards and trying to figure out, you know, I, new iPhone just came out and then people are complaining about, uh, you know, that the battery is not, is not very good and that that may either affect uh, Apple, but more likely it's going to affect the whoever Apple is buying their batteries from, or whatever parts they're buying from to make the battery. So you can you can you can make some uh, assumptions on based on on, on on that sort of data. Um, sometimes you can you can catch some interesting rumors or important things that 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 can that can be retrieved from uh, from social media. Uh, news is obviously uh, a good place of data. I and mean, it, it, it's been around for a long time, but technology has evolved relatively recently that allows it allows you to more easily process and extract automatically data from the news. I think quantitative funds are more likely to use that so they can react to some positive or negative or surprising in some way news story to to trade on it faster than that human human traders can um, geolocation data is also very very popular data uh, usually comes from either phone companies or from uh, people who install applications on, on your Phones that that require them to, to check in every every once in a while, and based on that, they can they can figure out uh, where you are or anonymize you. They aggregate that data and then they 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 sell it to, to people, and then the people can can tell you know how how many people were at McDonald's each day in June or. or and then and, and based on that, they can compare it to June of previous year and then and, and see how how McDonald's might be uh, might be doing in uh, uh, second quarter. Um, and there, there there are a lot of a lot of other types of uh, alternative data. Recently, I was. Uh, introduced to, to people who track uh, data specific to, to cannabis production that, that, and they actually have a pretty pretty sophisticated uh, pretty sophisticated uh, system to, to both analyze the data and uh, and uh, uh, give you give you raw data it's pretty clear that they that they probably don't use the product themselves because it's, it's it seems like a very very high quality, very high quality organization. Uh, there are shipping manifests. There are, uh, you know, travel reservation data. There are 
uh, oh, well, you know, the microwave data that uh, tracks uh, oil ships in, 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 in real time. And there's all, all kinds of data that can be now bought and analyzed and incorporated into your uh, trading strategies. Um, so how, how, how can you use that data? The, the most obvious one, and, and, and that's something that quantitative funds have been doing for, for a long time, at least some of them, before there was a, something called this alternative data, and that's signal generation. You, you look at, at, at some piece of data, you, you analyze it, and, and, and your algorithm tells you to, to buy or sell or actually goes in and then buys it sells. Uh, on its own, and that's 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 the most obvious way, I guess, of uh, of doing it. Uh, a little less obvious is, is is KPI prediction. So you can you can go and and you can analyze data and you can predict certain things that uh, you didn't know before, or you 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 knew and but now you can you can predict them before anybody else knows that, and then that there's kind of an arms race to to figure it out, then using those KPIs, you can you can go and you can uh, you can decide how you're going to how you're going to act based on on, on that prediction. Um, and then idea generation, right? So you 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 may be able to analyze the data, and whereas uh, quantitative Algorithms can can actually go and say buy or sell. Uh, an idea generation algorithm might, might, based on on the data that they, they've analyzed, can say something weird is going on with with, with this security, or you you, you might want to might want to take a look. And based on that, you can you can. Uh, narrow down the number of uh, uh, ideas you're, you're analyzing and then and then you can you can make a more uh, targeted uh, investment so you, a, a human analyst doesn't doesn't have to go and then and see through whatever 8,000 stocks that, that they might be might be covering or however many thousands of bonds that there are you can you can take uh, an algorithm, and then and, uh, the algorithm will figure out something that 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 might be interesting. And that, that from that more limited universe, you can you can make uh, uh, better decisions. Uh, and then one-off analysis. One-off analysis are things that you know that there there's some event, or you you're, you're trying to figure out something. Uh, that uh, that may or, may or may not happen. You know, you there is a uh, norovirus outbreak at some location in Chipotle, and not to besmirch Chipotle, but uh, you know, there, the, something like that is likely to cause some people to stop going to Chipotle or at, at least for a period of time, right? And uh, you, and but they, they have to go somewhere else and, and chances are that will probably go some something similar. So you can look at foot traffic data and you can say, okay, as look, after the news of this uh, uh, outbreak have come out, people, you know, 10% of people Stop going to Chipotle and instead they start going to to Panera Bread, and they, based on that you can you, you can actually look and see how how sticky that change has been, and then and, and perhaps it's it's a number that's negligible for 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 this particular event. So you you're not going to change your view on Chipotle, but if, it, if it's significant, then 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 you might want to sell that and then and buy Panera. Uh, so that there's there's a lot of one-off kind of uh, things that, that that could be interesting that that you couldn't get 
uh, data on before, but but now with with uh, advent of alternative data, is it is quite possible. Um, so what, what is the learn of the role of machine learning in, in AI? And I kind of uh, I, I prefer to use machine learning than AI. To me, AI is, is more something like you you would see on um, um, on uh, Westworld, uh, but machine learning is is, is something more down to earth and you know you you taught machine something and now it learned and now it, it, it knows how to how to do something so how to recognize some images or count something in the image or make a prediction or classify something or cluster something so uh if the machine doing something relatively simple but something that the human cannot do because human it is difficult for humans to process uh, or, or impossible to process this much information uh, uh, this quickly. Uh, so what, what what can you do? Predicting KPIs is is, is a very big thing for, for for machine learning. You you if you have some some, some kind of ground truth and, and you try to predict how uh, from from some limited or relatively limited data set. Uh, you can predict, you know, change year over year change in in, in sales at at Macy's or something like that. Uh, that that can be uh, very valuable to 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 your analysts. You know, or you can you can predict based on some other data that you know our GDP is going to contract rather than grow like everybody is expecting so that 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 may be interesting to a whole whole bunch of people including um uh quantitative uh, algorithms because in that scenario the regime of the market has has changed um cluster identification is is another one where you can you can give uh, the algorithm a bunch of data and it can find some some interesting patterns in that data of, of things that that act similarly in similar circumstances or stocks that act similarly and based on that you can you can start making predictions of how they're going to act in the future and then find anomalies in that and then then assume that those anomalies are going to be eliminated so you can you can uh, make trades uh, based on that. Um, black box trading is, is again, an, an obvious one, and it's a little bit uh, scary, but you, you, you definitely want to uh, use some machine learning techniques to, to, to generate signals and to and actually place trades uh, based on based on that analysis. Um, natural language processing is, is is a very useful machine learning technique for for various things. Again, social media sentiment. You're not going to go and uh, read through billions of of uh, of uh, Twitter messages to see how many people are complaining about Apple batteries, uh, but a machine can 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 certainly look at that and they can figure out that people are complaining about uh, Apple batteries and then and, and not uh, uh, you know some uh, GMO apples that they don't like. Uh, same thing with, with analyzing news. You you you, you want to look at a news article. You want to figure out that they're talking about a specific entity that you're you're interested in. Uh, you can figure out whether this uh, sentiment is is positive or negative. Uh, sometimes you can you can figure out what they're talking about. You know. Uh, 
Elon Musk is uh, promising to take Tesla private, right? That's that's not just a positive news. That's an important uh, piece of news that, that you might want to trade on. And then the machine learning can can definitely uh, can definitely identify these and uh, either tell you algorithms that might trade on it or, or tell the analyst that there is an important piece of news like that. And you can you can analyze regulatory uh, filings and uh, you know read through uh, thank yous or thank yous or um, uh, any kind any kind of re regulatory filing. You can there there are some algorithms or some some people who are writing algorithms that uh, listen to. Uh, calls with analysts and they try to analyze the, the emotion or intonations of of management to to figure out how optimistic or how confident they are and and, and what they're saying uh, and that's that's definitely done with with uh, very complicated machine learning uh, algorithms um, data processing and, and cleaning is also an important thing. Uh, Entity extraction is a, is a very complicated uh, uh, thing when, when you try to, it's easier to extract entities from uh, text that, that makes sense, such as, say, a news article. It's a lot harder to uh, extract entities from uh, like credit card transactions or some, some other types of transactions where uh, you don't know if uh, you know San Diego Zoo is a, is is one entity versus and then it's all in, in in lower case with no punctuation and the formats are different from for different credit card processing companies and uh, it is it's it, it can become a nightmare. Uh, and then uh, data normalization is another very complicated task where you, you, you have a data set where uh, you have, I don't know, five, five years worth of data, but the, uh, the panel has, may have changed dramatically, right? You, you, you might have started with uh, 10,000 people living in San Francisco for the first year, and then it expanded to, to all of Northern California, then it expanded to, to the United States, then it expanded to um, uh, worldwide, and then young people stopped using, stopped, appear, stopped appearing in the panel, and all the, all the older people started appearing because young people are using some different product right now and you can't capture them so all, all this kind of stuff can affect uh, the conclusions that you will derive from from the data and you will need to to try to identify it and try to try to normalize it out or try to impute uh, some of the historic or forward-looking data uh, based on um, based on some other data. So you can you can use some uh, um, you know the dimensionality reductions or, or primary component analysis techniques to, to try to try to figure that out. So so machine machine learning I think is is, is already playing a, a significant role. It's probably going to become more and more important as as the analysis is going to become uh, more and more sophisticated. And what 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 are the legal and, and regulatory issues with with with, uh, with usage of of uh, alternative data? There, 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 there are many with, with web scraping. Uh, a lot of companies don't don't like it that you're scraping their data. You know, they they put it out for for people to look with their eyes. They don't want bots to to, to go and scrape it and then and, and keep it and uh, 
potentially resell it to somebody else if it's it's their data and they might put a robot.txt file in there that says, hey, don't scrape my data. Does it have any kind of legal uh, uh, standing? It, it, it's, it's not clear. I think LinkedIn was trying to prevent people from, uh, uh, prevent one, one company from scraping their data and they actually uh, lost their case, or at least they, they got some, some unfavorable rulings. But there has, hasn't been a lot of, um, a lot of uh, court cases to give us guidance of what, uh, what uh, the legal authorities is thinking about, well, what, what's legal, what's not legal. Most people think that creating a fake account uh, and, and using that to scrape data is, is probably going too far or trying to bypass capture that uh, is intended to prevent people from uh, from scraping data. But again, there hasn't been anybody who's been prosecuted for 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 bypassing capture or, or there hasn't been a lot of lawsuits that, that people can reference. Um, so that's that, that's the big gray area and, and, and not a lot of people know what's um, what's legal, but nobody wants to be the first one to, to be sued for something like that and, and, and get a lot of uh, negative headlines. Um, material non-public information. Uh, in, in the olden days, which, which is like three years ago, um, there, were, there were a lot of funds who, who wanted to get not just data, but they wanted to get it exclusively. So they would say, okay, well, we'll pay you extra if you don't sell it to anybody else. Um, it, it, it's become a lot less common. And then one reason for that is that it, it's very unclear whether uh, doing something like that amounts to, to, to you gathering non material, not public information. Um, it's, you know, if you can trade on it, it's probably material. If, if nobody else can get it, it's probably not public. You're not getting it directly from the company. So again, it's, it's, it's a great gray area, but again, it's not something that you want to risk your firm's reputation on. Uh, so some people are even saying if, if a data set costs $500,000 a year, is it really public? Can, can, can Joe Sixpack who, who, who trades on uh, E-Trade uh, get something like that? And if not, then, then it's not fair to him. But you know, Joe, Joe Sixpack can, can get a Bloomberg terminal either. So typically, so it's uh, again, again, a lot, a lot of gray areas. Um, uh, personal, personal identifiable information is, is, is another thing. Um, a lot of people want to get data at, at the most granular level and a lot of companies will sell it to them and anonymize, but Anonymized by, by combining data sets or by uh, doing some, and I'm actually just saying that, that I need to stop talking soon. Uh, you, can, you can basically, you can figure out what, uh, um, you, can, you can figure out a person, even, even if the data is, is anonymized. Uh, and then explainability, you want to be able to explain uh, how, how your decisions are made and then some of the usage of machine learning can, can, can make it uh, difficult. Um, I think Alex actually talked a lot about technology, so I'm not going to uh, repeat myself. There, there is a lot of stuff that, uh, that people are using and, it, and then I think he, he covered it pretty well. And, is there any alpha? I, I think that there is, and there's probably going to be for a while, and you can achieve it by combining data sets, doing nonlinear analysis. And even if the, a lot of this stuff is plugged in, is, is already priced in, if you're the only one who doesn't know uh, what it is, 
then then you're going to um, then you're going to uh, lose money. So thank you very much, and uh, I'm looking forward to your questions. Uh, thank you so much, Dimitri. Um, we're now going to open it up to questions. Uh, we only have just a couple minutes left, um, so we'll jump right into it. Uh, Alex, I think the first question is for you. Uh, how does DevOps fit into a modern data architecture? So, I mean, I, I think I may have uh, mentioned this when, uh, uh, when I started with my introduction, but I come from a DevOps background, and I think you can't do cloud data architecture if you're still thinking about how do you make manual changes. Um, and you can't be doing it if you think about the manual changes or even automated changes being done outside of your group. If your domain cares about what's happening in production, you should have an idea of what happens to get things into production. And uh, you should be working towards a way of doing it yourself, supported by teams around you, um, supported by your friends. But, but really, the the best success cases for really moving a whole organization towards cloud and toward a modern data architecture are when I hear that a business user has pushed a change and that has shown up in a production report and no one bats an eye. That should be routine and that everyone should be on board with, uh, with making that happen. Okay, thanks. Uh, one for Dimitri. Uh, do fundamental and quantitative funds use alternative data differently? Um, they, they, they definitely do. Uh, fundamental funds, uh, quantitative funds typically try to generate a signal based on, 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 their, on their data analysis. They, they, they want to say buy or sell, or they, 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 they may want to make a, a, a sizing or a portfolio construction decision based on based on that. Uh, fundamental funds, they're not trying to do that. They're, they're trying to predict some sort of a KPI that can then be used by, by human analysts to uh, make a decision on, uh, on buying or, or, or selling. Um, uh, so it's, it's, it's definitely, definitely different type Different, different type of analysis, different uh, uh, outcome, and uh, they often look at the, the different kind of data. All right, thank you. We have time for just one more question. Uh, this one, I'll put it for you, Alex. What skills do practitioners need to take advantage of a modern data architecture? Um, so I think that the when you look at this. Um, Look at one of those diagrams that I was talking about. Uh, a comfort with the data itself is essential. Um, but then on top of that, an idea of, of how those map to the cloud terminal, how, how the, those map to the cloud terminology. Um, so that you know that IAM and authentica authentication and authorization have to be handled differently. You need to be in those kinds of positions um, uh, in order to take a really good advantage of this. And then understand when the data is in motion, how is it, um, uh, how is it governed? Um, who's in charge of it? Who's the data owner? Who's the, uh, how do we know that this quality means, you know, quality good? Uh, who gets to decide what quality means? Those kinds of questions. I think those are ideas that if you aren't already thinking about them as a practitioner, those should be where you should be directing your, your training. All right, excellent, thank you. And uh, we've run out of time for today, so I hope you've all enjoyed today's webinar. And please reach out to me at Remy, R-E, M as in Michael, Y, at Caserta.com with any questions. Thank you all, and I hope to hear from you soon.